Howdy everyone, this is the Pioneer 18,000 BTU Inverter Plus heat pump. I actually initially made this one long video on my main channel, but thought I'd break it down into smaller, more digestible pieces over here. That said, this video is going to be solely dedicated to this unit's installation. If you're curious why I chose this model or how it performs, I'll upload those separately. When it's time to actually get going, we start with the air handler. With your kit, you'll receive a mounting template that will line everything up. In my case, I had to find a spot that would both hit a couple studs and clear the exterior gutter downspout. I also had to make sure it was in the exact right spot vertically. One issue I first saw before even receiving the unit was how to cleanly seal the exterior penetration and line set cover against lap siding. My solution was a custom 3D printed mounting block and matching interior flange. I'll make this file available on Thingiverse if anyone wants to use it. Basically, I needed to make sure the 2.5 inch hole exited the building directly under a lap. The solution was to figure out where I needed to be horizontally and then drill a pilot hole from the outside in. To accomplish this, I'm using a 12 inch long installer bit and a digital angle gauge. Keep in mind, you'll want to keep a bit of slope to your in-wall pipe so any condensation that inadvertently gets in there will be able to run out. For this reason, uh, I made sure the exterior and interior flanges were offset by 10 degrees, hence needing to drill the pilot hole at the same angle. Uh, here's basically what the in-wall assembly looks like, two printed parts plus some two and a half inch PVC. To be clear, Pioneer does include a sleeve and flange, but it seemed a bit flimsy. Again, I'll make this file available to anyone who wants to print it. I'll even try to make a couple variations to accommodate several different common lap siding profiles. Anywho, after the pilot is drilled, I can move on to drilling the interior hole. I wanted to do this first in case there was anything unexpected like a water pipe in the wall. I figured it would be a lot easier to patch drywall than sheathing and fiber cement. After everything looked good, I finished the penetration on the outside and test fit the assembly. <laughs> like a glove. Back inside and with the pipe cut to length, I needed to install the printed flange. I modeled it with three drywall anchors in mind and a flattened bottom so it wouldn't be visible behind the mounted air handler. Looks pretty decent, right? With that locked in place, we can use it to mark off the location of the mounting plate, making sure to hit the two studs I've got available right here. Now it's time to start prepping the air handler. Begin by removing the cover over the electrical box. If I'm being honest, it could do a little better here. It's basically held in place with delicate plastic clips that seem as though they would break if you don't pry it in just the right spot. Screws would have been nicer. Next, feed the control cable from the back of the handler forward. From here, it should be pretty easy to attach the control and power wires. I had to use some needle nose pliers to guide everything into place because the working area is awkwardly small. In any case, green always goes to ground. The other three can go to any of the numbered slots, provided you follow the same pattern down on the condenser. I used red, white, and black because that seemed easy to remember. Uh, there is also a cable clamp in here that will hold everything in place. Don't forget to screw that down. Then just pop that cover back on and flip her over. It's actually up to you which side of the indoor unit you want to exit the line set from. If exiting from the right when looking at the back, you'll actually make your flare connections inside. That point wasn't clear in the instructions, so I had to check with support on that one. If you were exiting on the left, as I'm doing here, you'll need to bend the two refrigerant lines outwards. It's actually pretty easy. Just grab the base and twist up. Uh, the gas line is pre-twisted at the factory to facilitate this bend. Uh, now it's time to wrap everything that will go through the wall. I'm using this UV resistant line set tape, but honestly, if I were to do it again, I'd just use vinyl electrical tape or the weird non-adhesive stuff included by Pioneer. Uh, this stuff isn't very flexible and was almost too sticky. Um, two things to keep in mind here. First, the condensate line needs to be on the bottom. According to the manufacturer, drainage will be impeded if it's not. You'll also want to consider the diameter of the ultimate bundle as it will need to slide through the wall pipe without too much pressure. When you're ready to place the unit on the mount, it might be a good idea to grab another set of hands. 
Of the whole installation, this was the step I most wanted some help with. Trying to feed a thick line set and a bunch of extra control cable through a hole in the wall while balancing an air handler on your shoulder um, is challenging. Nevertheless, I managed, but not without a little bit of difficulty. I honestly feel like the template is off by about half an inch. I was having trouble getting the unit to mount properly. Uh, I even brought the template back out to make sure everything was where it was supposed to be. It looked fine, but I still went ahead and moved the bracket up a bit, which allowed me to remount the air handler, this time nice and level, and was able to securely snap it on the bracket. So that means it's time to move outside. I went with some brackets from G-Scent on Amazon that worked out great. They're galvanized and have a nice thick powder coat, and most importantly, could be mounted inverted. That is with the horizontal arms on top of the wall brackets. Interestingly, and I have no idea why, this unit requires 12 inches of rear clearance if slab mounted on the ground, but only four inches if bracket mounted. If anybody knows why it would make a difference, please let me know, I'm genuinely curious. All right, minor issue here. Uh, when I mounted these brackets, they were dead level, but when I uh, put the uh, condenser on here, it sort of uh, settled a little unevenly. So I'm kind of thinking it's because this side has all the uh, the motor, the compressor in it, all the, all the heavy stuff is over here, and it's pretty light over here, so I think it's just flexing the black brackets a little bit uh, unevenly. So I have some nice big uh, stainless steel fender washers, I'm going to try and level it out with that. Perfect. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the most nerve-wracking part of this install, at least for me anyways, bending down the two refrigerant lines. I was honestly nervous here because it seemed like the one step that, if done incorrectly, could really cause a headache. Like, if I were to kink either of them, the subsequent repair would not be easy. To help mitigate this risk, Pioneer has integrated a spring-style tubing bender on the liquid line, but not one for the gas. Why they cheaped out here, I'll never know. In any case, I managed the bend without issue, which was a huge relief. Next up, I decided to work on mounting the line set cover. I went with a four inch version from Turbro. If anyone ends up using the mounting block I made, it's got holes modeled in specifically for this product. Uh, I know these line set covers are generally considered optional, but in my mind, they're borderline mandatory. That upper piece ends up doing a lot to shed water away from the wall penetration, especially if you take the time to seal it up well. I personally wouldn't consider an install without them. As I brought the line set down, my routing had me making a sharp 90. I was a little worried about kinkage here, so I decided to use some spring style tubing benders, hence why I'm cutting away the insulation. Don't worry, it's easy to reinstall. With these in place, making the bend is easy and worry-free. You are then left with a nice clean sweep. And then of course I'll do the same thing as I bring the lines around to meet up with the condenser. Now that our tubing is where we want it, we'll need to cut and reflare the connection. If you don't have a tubing cutter, you'll really want to buy one for this project. They're by far the best tool to use if you want a precise, clean, square cut on soft copper lines. All right, and now it's time to perform a little flaring action here. Flare nut goes on. And find the appropriate size clamp, half inch, right there. Leave, I don't know, about a sixteenth of an inch, couple millimeters there. Clamp that in there like such. You always want to make sure that little pin snaps into those grooves there. There we go. And then just twist. In a second here, there'll be a little snap when it releases. There it is. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I feel like that flare is not quite big enough. 
So, I'm going to do it again. Now, you don't actually have to go out and buy Nylog because Pioneer actually provides you with some. Pretty nice, huh? Go ahead and repeat that process for both lines. Really want to take your time here. My guess is that improperly made flare connections is where many DIY installs fail. There is a bit of an art to them, so if you've never made them, you should definitely practice on the cutoff bit of tubing before moving on to the real thing. All right, so now I'm gonna torque these flare fittings. And a lot of people might wanna skip this step and think they can just use regular wrenches. And you might be able to get away with it, but honestly, it's pretty important to uh, torque these to the correct manufacturer's specs. Um, especially on these smaller ones, you can actually easily over torque them because if you think about it, it's just sort of a thin wall of soft copper making that seal. So if you over torque them, you can easily pop that seal. So I've got my uh, makeshift crow foot adapter there. When you use a regular torque wrench uh, with the torque it, with the crow foot adapter at 90 degrees, then you don't need to make any. Uh, torque adjustments if is like you would if it was parallel. So I've got it set at 11.8. Wrong way. Nice. And then for the big guy, we're looking at 26.6. The last thing I want to work on as far as connections go is the electrical hookup. If you recall earlier, we used the red, white, and black pattern when connecting the unit inside. We'll want to make sure to repeat that pattern here. You'll notice that I am deviating from the instructions a little bit. They don't make any mention of securing the cable in the knockout hole. I've seen some people get around this by running it in some liquid tight conduit. I suppose that's one way of doing it, but as a general rule, you don't run jacketed cable in conduit. You run individual conductors. In this case, the entire cable itself is an exterior rated UV resistant product. What I went ahead and did was utilize a liquid tight cord connector for a half inch knockout. It looks like this. Basically the left side has a gasket and a lock nut that provides a weather tight seal with the condenser while the right side has an o-ring that tightens against the cord when the nut is tightened down. Here's what that looks like from the outside when it's installed. Back in the junction box, here's the wired up assembly, red, white, and black on the left, and incoming power on the right. Because this is a 240 volt unit, we only have two spots for two hots. So it doesn't actually matter whether you use L1 or L2 for red and black. In the case of a 120 volt unit, you'll need to pay close attention to which lug is for your hot, black, and which lug is for your neutral, white. Oh, and here's a quick shot of what's going on in the disconnect box, located about three feet from the condenser. Two hots form line power in the middle, while the two load conductors send power to the AC. The ground wire is coupled via a small bar in the center. So, with all our connections made, it's time to start testing. The audio here was a little messed up, so I'll just tell you what's going on. I'm pressure testing using CO2. This is a perform at your own risk type procedure. Many DIYers skip this step, instead opting to leak check simply by verifying their system holds a vacuum. This may work fine, especially if you've taken the time to really make nice flare connections. Most HVAC techs will perform the step using nitrogen because it's a dry, inert gas. I didn't have any of that available, but I did have carbon dioxide used for home brewing, aka food grade, so at least 99.9% .9 pure. I did a lot of forum research beforehand to determine if this was acceptable, and the general consensus seems to be yes, with an asterisk. 
The main concern here was whether the CO2 being used contained moisture, which we don't want in the system. My thought here was twofold. One, it's food grade, so how much moisture could really be in a product guaranteed to be 99.9% .9 CO2? And since we're going to be evacuating the system next, wouldn't any theoretical moisture introduced be pulled right back out, especially considering it would be vapor in a vacuum? So that's what I'm doing. Nitrogen is best, but CO2 is pretty good too. In my opinion, the pros of testing at 250 PSI outweigh any potential risks of moisture introduction. You may or may not draw the same conclusion. All right, so that uh, leak test worked out pretty well. We're still holding just uh, perfectly right a hair above uh, 250. I took a before and after picture, uh, and they look pretty good to me, so I'm gonna go ahead and release that pressure. Now it's time to pull our vacuum. Here we go. Alright, so I just ran that for about 20-25 minutes to hopefully get a nice tight vacuum on there. Uh, not quite down to negative 30 because it was a little bit over zero to begin with. So I'm going to leave this for about another 20 minutes and make sure we hold that vacuum. Alright guys, it's been a half hour and we've still got a nice tight vacuum on there so I think we're good to go. Uh, but now we have a little bit of a dilemma and that is how to disconnect this because we've got a vacuum in the system which basically means if I were to simply undo this right now, I would actually suck a little bit of air back in there because that Schrader valve is not particularly fast. Alternatively, I could actually release the refrigerant now. I might lose a little bit in the lines. I might lose some as I'm undoing this, but theoretically, uh, I wouldn't be sucking air in. I'd be pushing refrigerant out. But then I was thinking that might lead to an undercharged system, which isn't ideal. And then I thought, what if, what if there was a third way? What if I release just a tiny bit of refrigerant, just enough to bring this up to zero, and then I undid that, and then I released the rest of the refrigerant? Theoretically, there wouldn't be any pressure differential then to either push refrigerant out or suck air in. So that's what I'm going to attempt. Alright, I just released a tiny bit of refrigerant and I reclosed that valve and I brought it right back to zero. Now I can undo this, hopefully with not much of a hiss. Perfect. Now let's release the rest of that. Now some of you might be wondering if there is an alternative to pressure testing and vacuuming if you're willing to accept a little more risk. And the good news is there is. The manufacturer actually endorses flushing the lines with a product they sell called QuickiVac. Instead of pulling air out of the lines, it replaces it with um, something. In other words, if you've got faith in your flare connections and don't want to buy a vacuum pump, give this stuff a try. It's not for me, but I thought I'd at least point out its existence. That said, I think I'm about done with this installation. All right, so pressure test held, vacuum test held. We released the refrigerant. So there's only one thing left to do. All right, well, no trip GFCI, so that's a good sign. Well, let's hit that on button. Ha <laughs> ha yeah. Let's make it nice and cold. <laughs> 